Oh, camera. She did. Camera. Yeah, you're on. Smile. Good evening. I'm Paul Fredette, and with me here is my wife, Karen. Together, we serve hermits and religious solitaries around the world through Raven's Bread Ministries from our home here in the mountains of Western North Carolina. In our last presentation, we took a look at the start of Christian Eremitic life in the Middle East, the regions of Syria and Lebanon and Egypt. And we spent some time also looking at the early development in Europe until the Middle Ages with the rise of the mendicant orders, especially the Franciscans and the Dominicans. The hermits of the 11th and the 12th centuries reclaimed the main thrust, the main traits of the early desert fathers and mothers. Those main traits could pretty much be boiled down to four characteristics. First of all, and foremost, the physical separation from society. Secondly, a profound simplicity in their way of life. Thirdly, poverty. And fourthly, manual labor. But with the growth of the large monasteries in Europe at that time, that aspect of manual labor was pretty much abandoned by the choir religious in the Cenobitic expressions of religious life. Property owners or laborers, those were the two big social classes. And as the laborers, pretty much hermits fell on the social scale, and fell on the religious social ladder as well. And so there was a notable change of emphasis in Eremitic life going on at that time. And while all the traits were the same, more emphasis was being put on poverty and on manual labor than was being put on spirituality and contemplative prayer, which had been the distinguishing hallmarks of hermits in the eyes of ordinary people. Now, hermits became pretty much the servants of the poor. They were doing tasks that even peasants and serfs of the day uh, were reluctant to do. Hermits could be found tending ferries. They were collecting tolls on bridges. They were keeping lighthouses in very rugged and far-off coasts. They were assisting the local harvesters for a portion, for a percentage of the harvest that they helped to gather in. Uh, they were doing road repair. And they were helping to maintain the village water supplies. Many of the female hermits of the day served as herbalists and providers of healing remedies, as well as counselors. Here we have the development of the what is known as the anchoress, the female hermit who was almost literally walled up in an anchor hold, a, uh, a stone structure that had been erected and affixed to the side of a church with only a small window looking into the church from where the anchoress could observe religious, obser uh, religious services and a small window looking out onto the village or onto the road that passed by where she could speak to other people, give advice, give counsel. Um, presumably there was some kind of door because most anchoresses had a servant of some kind yes. who would go and uh, take care of uh, errands and, and things, bringing in supplies and whatever. They also had cats. 
I was I was told. So definitely good authority. So definitely they would need a door. Definitely. <laughs> um, in summary, we could, but we could say that at this point in eremitic life, it seemed to be that this way of life was a refuge for those who, having lost face in the eyes of the world, couldn't be admitted to serve God in a monastery. For instance, many of these women anchoresses, most of them, of course, were mm -hmm. there by their own free decision and will, but there were some for whom this was an imposed penance for having lived a disreputable life and having this was a way of doing penance for previous very public kind of lifestyle that uh, needed to be uh, atoned, for. atoned for. Thank you. <laughs> uh, as the hermits steadily lost prestige they were more and more disregarded by the hierarchy until in time they fell out of religious law altogether and the solitary state was no longer accepted as a valid form of consecrated life and this condition perdured until the revision of canon law by the Roman Catholic Church in the 1980s after the Reformation began in the 16th century, the discredit that was falling upon religious life as a whole also tarred what was left of Eremitic life. And although hermits had found and maintained a small niche in the mendicant orders, for instance, your Franciscans and your Carmelites, for all practical purposes, Eremitic life ceased to exist as an independent lifestyle. And what had once been a way of life that was fairly familiar to the general population now became shrouded in a sort of mist that fostered romanticized and to some extent even ridiculous notions that persist even today. Yes, I was. Um, I would love to share with you something I came across when I was reading a book by um, Peter France entitled Hermits, The Insights of Solitude. He brought out that um, before hermit life began its revival in the uh, 17 and 1800s in Europe, and particularly in Great Britain, many of the wealthy families decided that it would be nice to establish a hermit in their formal gardens for both the entertainment and the edification of the family and their visitors. And this became so common that there was an actual architectural guide put out in the year 1767 which described various appropriate forms of hermitages that you might want to have in your garden. Uh, the, the lowest, the least expensive ones was one that was to be made out of trees, uh, 10 feet by 9 inches square and lined with moss. Then there was on the high end the Gothic Grotto which actually had six rooms all of which were to be lined with shells. You're beginning to get the picture that the ideal of a hermit as a person of prayer and solitude had sort of slipped out of sight. Uh, visitors um, were shown the hermits sitting in perhaps at the front of a cave on the property fondling a skull and looking melancholy. The word melancholy seemed to have taken the place of spiritual <laughs> in the ideal hermit's vernacular of the time. A Mr. Powis wanted to have a hermit living in an underground grotto on his property and he offered to support anybody 
who would live there for seven years. Well, the longest anyone stuck it out was four years. Although they were provided with food from his table, they could ring a bell and anything they needed was provided. If I read it correctly, they even had a chamber organ in their grotto, which I imagine was quite lovely at times. The most long-lived hermit that I read about was on the um, was the hermit to Lord Hill's father, who lived for 14 years at his father's estate, and he would be seen sitting at the entrance of the cave with an hourglass in one hand and wearing an old goat's beard. You know, the image of your old bearded hermit was alive <laughs> and well during those years. And this romantic image of the melancholy hermit persisted up until nearly the 1900s. Stepping away from hermit life per se, in the early 1900s, especially in America, the Catholic Church experienced a remarkable resurgence in religious life in general. And by the 1950s, people were flocking to religious houses and to seminaries in numbers that were unknown up until that time. And by then, that was even that was Europe, the British Isles, as well as America. Oh that yes, that phenomenon was happening. It was it was happening around the world, of the Catholic world at that time. Then came Vatican Council II, and the people were encouraged to look at their charism, the original inspiration, for their particular religious group. And as people began to do that they began to realize that the spirituality of their group had begun to fall aside in favor of more work and social work, work teaching, um, nursing for the religious women. Um, the men were manning the seminaries and the parishes throughout the country. After Vatican Council II, many of them began to realize that they were serving a God they did not yet really know and didn't even have time to know. And this attraction to prayer began to grow and many of them began to experience the call to hermit life. In our search today for modern day hermits, we don't need to look at those Gothic grottos. We don't need to search in caves or or out in the middle of the literal desert the hermits are in our midst uh, they're invisibly next to us uh, they're there with cell phones they're there with email just like you and I um, they're hidden in plain sight many we ask ourselves well what what sparked this interest in hermit life in the mid 20th century. Well, as I said, uh, Dom Jacques Wanandi in Europe was one of the great proponents during those years of the resurgence in hermit life. Here in America, uh, many would credit the writings of Thomas Merton with giving substance to that formless desire for solitude which many of these people experienced. Merton lived for 27 years in the monastery of Gethsemane Abbey, and it was only the last four years of his life that he received a permission to actually live in hermitage, to live apart from the community as a solitary. He was during those years, though, in all of his writings and in his teachings, a clear reminder to people of the existence and the value of eremitic life after a period when it was just considered a footnote that no longer existed in religious life. His journals and his writings are seminal to the resurgence of the Eremitic movement. I'd like to share with you a passage 
that so clearly uh, exemplifies uh, Merton's frame of mind with regard to this calling. He writes, the solitary life is an arid, rugged purification of the heart. St. Jerome and St. Eucherius have written rhapsodies about the flowering desert, but the Eremi culturas, the farmers of the desert sand, have had less to say about the experience. They have been washed out by dryness, and their burnt lips are weary of speech. Physical solitude sometimes takes on the aspect of bitter defeat. It is an earthly paradise only in the imaginations of those who find their solitude in the crowded city or who are able to be hermits for a few days or a few hours at a time, no more. But the call to perfect solitude is a call to suffering, to darkness, and to annihilation. Yet, when a person is called to it, he or she prefers this to any earthly paradise. The solitary who no longer communicates with others except for the bare necessities of life is someone with a special and difficult vocation. He or she soon loses all significance for the rest of the world. And yet, that significance is great. The hermit has a very real place in a world like ours that has degraded the human person and lost all respect for solitude. But in such a world, the vocation of the hermit is more terrible than ever. In the eyes of our world, the hermit is nothing but a failure. He or she has to be a failure. We have absolutely no use for them, no place for them. Powerful reflections. One of the phenomena that Karen and I have been very much a part of is that when the resurgence began in any life in the life of any hermit loneliness is part and parcel of the experience and as we've said in an earlier presentation unless we're willing to risk experiencing the loneliness we'll never move through it into solitude but what was a tremendously additional burden to the hermits who began to follow and respond to this call to solitude in the middle of the last century was that they also felt terribly isolated. They weren't aware of anyone else who was experiencing this same call. They felt they were totally alone in this, perhaps even crazy. And they really wondered about the legitimacy of this because they, were, they didn't know of anybody else. This was how much the way of life had fallen out of the mainstream of everybody's consciousness. So hermits, people who were looking at a life of religious solitary life, were hungering to just connect with another person just to make sure that they weren't totally off the charts, spiritually, mentally, however. And this is why Ravensbread, the newsletter, and, and our ministry, that's one of the ways in which we have tried to serve the hermit community, has been by just providing hermits with a sense that they are not alone that there are others who are following this same very difficult call and who are going through some of the same experiences that they are. The hermits at the time, having no place else to go and not knowing of anybody else, many of them looked to their diocesan bishops, their religious leaders. 
But diocesan officials, they were sadly uh, disappointed in the response that they received because diocesan officials reacted very much in a negative manner. They were very anxious about people coming to them with this kind of uh, call. They weren't, however, they weren't really anxious for the solitary safety. They were more anxious about the security of the diocese. They did not want to be uh, accountable. They did not want to have to uh, be financially responsible for a solitary that had no means, no gainful livelihood. And so they really experienced, these people who went to diocesan officials for help and guidance really were discouraged from pursuing this and largely were made to feel very unwelcome in the diocese, in the, the, the religious community that they were part of. However, not everybody reacted that way. And what we'd like to do now is to offer you a few verbal snapshots, so to speak, of some very spiritually courageous individuals in our own time who have helped to foster the resurgence of the Eremitic movement. Karen? Yes. When Paul was talking about the bishops, I was reminded of a statement that the bishops tended to regard hermits as somehow wolves and that were loose among their sheep because they felt that um, these unregulated hermits were not going to be something that was going to contribute to their control over their people. But there was one bishop, Bishop Remy de Rue, from Vancouver in the British Columbia, Canada, who had welcomed a number of male hermits into his diocese and was so impressed with them and through them had heard of other people being attracted to hermit life that when he was attending Vatican Council II, he made an intervention on behalf of reintroducing hermit life into the program of the church. That intervention included him pointing out that by recognizing once again hermit life, you had the ecumenical value of reconnecting spiritually with the Eastern and Orthodox churches which still maintained a respect for and a fair number of hermits. And also he brought out that the hermits who prayed were a value for the entire world, something that the church needed very much. His intervention was taken under discussion and when the um, new code of canon law came out in 1983. Lo and behold, there was one canon which was devoted to recognizing hermit life. And I want to say that I was very impressed with the simplicity of the canon. The, the, um, the good fathers who wrote it up had the wisdom not to do anything more then draw a bare outline which gave hermits the traditional freedom which they have always had. It, it was only one can and there were two parts. Part one, it is written, besides institutes of consecrated life, the church recognizes the eremitic or anchoritic life by which the Christian faithful devote their life to the praise of God and the salvation of the world through a stricter separation from the world, the silence of solitude, and assiduous prayer and penance. This is the heart of hermit life. Part 2 reads, A hermit is recognized in the law as one dedicated to God in a consecrated life if he or she 
publicly professes the three evangelical counsels, which are poverty, chastity, and obedience, confirmed by a vow or other sacred bond into the hands of the diocesan bishop and who observes his or her own plan of life under the bishop's direction. This was designed to give the bishops um, guidance on how to assist the hermits that came to them. But that didn't work too well. I know when in the late 1980s I myself after over 25 years as a cloistered nun tried to convince four separate bishops that I could live hermit life safely in their diocese and was informed that I would not be welcome. But that not all bishops were the same. The, um, the earliest form of religious life in the church has now been reinstated. Still, as Paul said, the hermits felt like they were very few and far between. Thomas Merton also said that the solitary life is nothing because the hermit produces nothing. And we live in a time and state where what you make is extremely important. He also added that the social upheavals that were taking place in the time of St. Anthony the First Hermit are here again on an even larger scale. Civil unrest, the social paradigm is undergoing major change. The hermits that came to Bishop Deru's diocese uh, stemmed pretty much from a group originating with uh, a very impressive person, uh, a Belgian Benedictine, Dom Jacques Wanandi, who himself had earlier encountered a Father Lionel Parr in Martinique while they were in Martinique together. And Father Parr had discussed his strong calling to a life of solitude with Dom Wanandi, and within the year, the two of them had built hermitages under the aegis of their local bishop. Well, several moves later, they settled on Vancouver Island with a growing colony of hermits. Eventually, Dom Wanandi moved back to Europe and settled in a 17th century hermitage where he uh, lived out his life and taught and wrote and became a correspondent with Thomas Merton in America. One of the people who was part of that colony with uh, Dom Wanandi was Charles Brandt, a correspondent of ours. He was at one time an Anglican priest who converted to Roman Catholicism. And one of the very special things about Charles is that when he was ordained for the Roman Catholic Church in Bishop Deru's diocese, he was specifically ordained as a priest hermit, the first such ordination in over 200 years. He lives on the Oyster River out there in British Columbia and has become over the years a champion for the, the welfare of the river against entrepreneurs and developers who would, uh, for uh, the sake of progress, uh, change the, the quality uh, of the river itself. Charles makes his living as a bookbinder and as a photographer and is an excellent photographer. We are, it's a pleasure for us to receive cards uh, and correspondence from him because he includes his photographs and they're stunning. One of the other priests uh, during that period of time was Father William McNamara, a Carmelite priest who had been encouraged during an audience with Pope John XXIII and established the Spiritual Life Institute in 1960 in Arizona. 
It was the first hermit community in the American Catholic Church. And in doing this, Father McNamara reestablished that ancient form of eremitic life, the hermit Laura, where on one tract of land, hermits would come together and build individual hermitages and contribute uh, to a common, uh, I think there was some kind of common fund, but they would on occasion, on a regular basis, attend uh, religious services or take a common meal or whatever, but they lived on their own independently in solitude in their own hermitages. One of the really interesting things about Father McNamara and the Institute for Spiritual, uh, the Spiritual Life Institute, is that in 1967, a woman, Tessa Balecki, arrived there to assume duties as the editor of their periodical, The Desert Call. This represented a profound shift because it involved the admission of a woman to the core group that was mostly men. Brave men. Brave, right? brave men. <laughs> brave woman. Um, but it set a precedent and the hermit community grew of men and women firmly committed to celibacy, living together in their own individual hermitages on a particular part of a particular tract of land and praying at times together, taking common meals once in a while together, uh, having each their own work and their way of maintaining their livelihood, but, but living together in, in a community of sorts. This community has flourished and spread. It spread to Nova Scotia in 1972. It uh, established itself in Colorado in 1983 and in Ireland in 1995. And there was even a small lay community, including families, that uh, was established, been established since 2000 uh, in the New Pine Creek, Oregon area. Karen? Well, as we're talking about the different types of people that have been drawn to hermit life, one of the um, religious groups that always had hermit life as their basic charism are the Carmelites. They look back to their original rule, the primitive rule of St. Albert, as it is called, which was written up in around the 12 or 1300s, and who proposed Elijah as the spiritual founder for the Carmelites. Over the years, especially for the women, they were literally forced into living a communal life within a small area of their, known as their priory. After Vatican II, as they began to study their original charism, which was basically Eremitic, a number of them felt within them the deep, deeper call to again live in solitary, live as hermits. The um, the sad part of the story is that they were not allowed to do this and they had to make the choice of either giving up that dream which was really a call or leaving their com vowed commitment and um, going out on their own and the thing I'm proud to say is that many of them had the, the strength and the intestinal fortitude to do just that. Among them was a sister Angela Wincock and another Imelda Kinnearum who left different Carmelite priories but met together mm -hmm. and formed a small group in Amory, Wisconsin. The earliest attempts for um, forming living as hermit life, most of them thought of moving into an established group without realizing that they were carrying over some of the sense of security that comes from a group and also carrying over 
the, I, the necessity of having an elected superior, of having um, years of probation. You could almost predict what happened. The mm. groups did not hold together because they hadn't come together with that intention. So instead of being a Laura, most of them ended up living apart individually as hermits. Their bishops generally knew they were there and to a greater or lesser extent was um, receptive to their presence in the diocese. One Laura that um, is still in existence is outside a men's Benedictine monastery in Ava, Missouri. And there are several small houses there and the monks take it on themselves to act as spiritual guides and unofficial directors for the religious women who are living hermit life there. One of the Carmelites who left and on her own was Sister Judith of God. She did not want to join another group but moved out on her own and was one of the very first women to be able to go directly from her vows as a Carmelite nun to profession as a canonical hermit under her bishop which was in Okefenokee, Florida. Florida. She lived at Star of the Sea Hermitage down there. Sister Alice Ruth Carr, another Carmelite, has an interesting story. She was an opera singer and at the age of 50 entered a Carmelite community. Ten years later, after being a solemn professed Carmelite, she felt this call to hermit life. And she also was able to make this transition from a vowed Carmelite to a um, canonical hermit, as it is called. And she lived in a m little mobile home outside of a um, men's group, men's monastery in Little Rock, Arkansas. Not all hermits have been religious. Many of them nowadays especially are secular men and women who are moving into hermit life. One of the first w was Sister Joan Sutherland, a teacher in Pennsylvania, who for many years discerned the call to hermit life and finally decided it was she had to follow it. She started out having only her car, a hundred dollars in her purse, and a few personal items in her car. When her car broke down on her way through a small town in West Virginia, she saw that as a sign for God, from God and there she would stay. Bishop Hodges was very receptive to having hermits in his diocese and after he was convinced of Sister Joan's um, sincerity and stability, he gave her some land and also some money in order to build a small hermitage mm -hmm. on the property. I knew Sister Joan only through the taped letters that we exchanged when I was um, discerning my own call to hermit life. Now not only were secular people entering hermit life, but even married people have begun and that is one of the things that Raven Spread has helped to bring to the awareness of people. Mm -hmm. Now Sister Joan passed away in 2005 as many hermits expect to do in her own hermitage and she was found there the following morning by a Father Dick Height. Yes, and Father Dick Height, a religious priest who, by the way, was, it's interesting to note that many of the religious women were compelled to make a choice between remaining in their religious communities 
or having to leave their religious communities in order to become religious solitaries. Whereas many of the religious priests who have made that same journey were not required to leave their religious communities. One of those was Father Dick Height, who had initially sought counseling and advice from Joan Sutherland in West Virginia and wound up actually establishing himself as a hermit on the same property that Bishop Hodges had donated to Joan Sutherland. They were friends and he continued to live there until she passed away in 2005. Not all priests uh, have stayed though in their religious communities. We know one priest in particular, a former Trappist, who did choose to leave his community and he established himself uh, on a tract of land in East Texas where he built several hermitages one of which is occupied by one of those same sisters who was compelled to make that decision and she made that decision after she too was one of those who sought the advice and the help of Joan Sutherland in discerning her call to solitude. Among some of those early women was also sister Cecilia Wilms who uh, accidentally discovered her calling while on a medical leave of absence from her Cistercian Abbey of Our Lady of the Redwoods in California. She wrote something very beautiful. She said that she had discovered a solitary way to live her monastic commitment in the desert of the city, in the service of God and of the Church, which she did do in a very poor neighborhood of Spokane, Washington, within walking distance of Gonzaga University where she earned a small stipend working in the library there. The consecration of hermits, canonical hermits, was not a possibility back in 1974 so Cecilia Wilms became, was admitted as a hermit as a consecrated virgin by Bishop Topol at that time and eventually Cecilia died in her own apartment hermitage in 1998, faithful to that vocation for her entire life. Franciscan sister Carol Marie Kelly embarked on her adventure in the monastery in the uh, Monterey Diocese of California in 1982, and while she was living out her solitude the solitude that she was drawn to so intensely spiritually, she chronicled her battles with numerous fears and misconceptions in a very well-written book entitled The Symbols of Inner Truth, Uncovering the Spiritual Meaning of Experience. And finally, there's Maggie Ross, the known de plume of a noted author, Sister Martha Reeves who was an Anglican nun who found her ideal hermitage in a basement flat of Christchurch in Oxford. After she first discovered the beauty of solitude while working in a vineyard. She spent three years in a retreat house and then she wandered, experimenting with wilderness existence and, and finally received formal recognition as a hermit with the most unusual ecumenical support that we've ever witnessed. Her profession as a solitary was received by New York Episcopal Bishop Paul Moore in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine with the co-sponsorship of the Roman Catholic Cistercians and the Anglican Franciscans. As we've noted several times before in these presentations, hermits can be found most everywhere. For instance, there's Richard Withers, a former bicycle repairman who made national news in 2001 when Cardinal Anthony Bevilacqua formally recognized him as a canonical hermit in his diocese. His hermitage is a tiny renovated row house that he bought from the city of Philadelphia for one dollar. And perhaps most colorfully, there's Gary Robertson, a one-time postal worker and picturesque character that dropped out of society back in 1975 
to follow a tenet that's common among hermits. God is in the silence. Well, society rediscovered Gary through an article that surfaced in the Winnipeg Free Press in 2001, and the journalist said he resembled a cross between Old Man Winter, the magician Merlin, and the prophet Elijah. His hermitage is made completely of salvage materials, and it's a landmark for canoeists along the White Mouth River in Manitoba talking about unusual hermitages. Um, a sister Betty Edel, who lives in the, I think up in Maine, was now living, um, who made her, li her livelihood through weaving vestments for priests and liturgical celebrations, eventually had a yurt built as her idea of the ideal hermitage with the circular imagery of always bringing her back to the center. One other form of hermit life which we'll only touch on briefly is the pilgrim hermit. And um, there is Pilgrim George who lives in Pennsylvania most of the year but during the warmer months plots a journey through various parts of the United States, Europe, and the UK, carrying a cross on a staff and the icon of Our Lady, who, and his goal is to walk the roads of the world showing off the body and life of Jesus to people who ordinarily would never see mm. it or think of it. But now it's time for us mm -hmm. to begin our prayer service. While Paul is getting ready to light our um, candle, I would ask you to try to relax. Perhaps stand up mm -hmm. and stretch. Try to give your body um, a feeling that it can be still breathing smoothly and one of the most delicious ways of relaxing is to kick off your shoes and wiggle your toes. You'll find that the relaxation ripples throughout your whole body. And now that we have lighted, lit the light, we will say our prayer. We light a light in the name of the one who creates life, in the name of the Savior who loves life, in the name of the Spirit who is the fire of life. I would like to offer you the opportunity of doing another guided imagery together. Let us picture ourselves out in the country on a lovely summer day. We are alone, but we're feeling quite comfortable. A well-defined path is just to our right, and we see that it disappears among the trees. We decide to take a walk and follow the path. It is pleasant in the woods. There are the usual sounds of birds and insects. We hear the squirrels up in the trees. Sunlight makes pretty shadows among the leaves. As you continue to walk along the winding pathway. A clearing comes into sight. It is rather sunny. On a log to one side, under a tree, someone is sitting. Someone that you somehow know is a wise person. You walk into the clearing. 
try to see yourself as you approach this person sitting on the lawn. After some silence, you look more closely. What does this person look like to you? Is, is he or she someone familiar? Someone you may have read about? Or a totally fictitious and yet very real wisdom figure. Does he or she draw you closer? How do you feel? You have a feeling that you would like to say something or perhaps hear something from this wise person. What is it? The wise person then asks you a question. What is it? You then feel drawn to ask the, them or him or her a question. What does your heart want to know? Gradually, the scene begins to fade. But you want to treasure what happened. Begin by noticing what your feelings are at this moment. For you remember, feelings never lie. They simply are there and tell us things about ourselves. Make an effort to record in some way your feelings and the experience so that you can return to it. Gradually you leave the scene and become, come back to your place where you are now. Hopefully you have received a gift. Something about which you will wish to pray. Paul would like to share a scripture with you. From the Book of Wisdom. I will tell you what wisdom is and how she came to be, and will trace her path from the beginning of time. I will make her teachings clear to you and will not pass by the truth. For the company of the wise is the salvation of the world. And those who love her receive great treasure. Wisdom is radiant 
like the whiteness of the moon, and more beautiful than the glistening stars. She is found by those who seek her, and makes herself known to those who long for her. She can be found sitting at the gateways of life, in every moment and on every path. She is a breath of the power of God and a pure flow of heaven's glory. She is a reflection of eternal light and an image of God's goodness. Wisdom was in the beginning with God. She is creation's artist and the fashioner of everything that exists. She loves right relationship and teaches justice and courage. She knows the things of old and senses the things to come. She understands all speech and can interpret every sign and wonder. And so I loved her and sought her from my youth. I chose her as my bride and have delighted in her presence. For she is the everlasting gift of God. Let's take a moment and in the silence of our hearts or in whatever way that the Spirit moves within us, give thanks for this day and pray for the life of the world. That you have placed a harmony of lights in the heavens. That night is followed by day and the glowing of the moon by the glistening of the sun. Thanks be to you, O God. That you have placed a harmony of lights in our souls, that there is gentleness and firmness of strength, intuitive knowing and enlightened reasoning. Thanks be to you. Let us be so sure of your law of harmony in all things, that we seek it in our own depths, and in knowing it in our inner life, yearn for it in the torn relationships of our world. Men and women, black and white, sun and moon, in a harmony of movement. In the silence of our hearts, we listen for wisdom, O God, that we may learn again that we are born of you, and that all people are bearers of your everlasting image. In the silence of our hearts, we listen. Once again, we want to take this opportunity to thank you all for being with us this evening and to thank those, especially Brother Sean and Mr. Holmes, who help us so much in the tech, with the technical aspects of putting these programs together. The blessings of heaven, the, heaven, the, the blessings, blessings of, of earth, the blessings, the blessings of sea and of sky, on those we love, we love this night, and, and on the, every human family, family the, the gifts, gifts of heaven, heaven the gifts of earth, the gifts of sea and sky. Good night, and God bless you all. God be with you all.